parts two and three of introduction and mostly with part three. Now, you notice the content of systematic theology in your little handout. Then after that, you have a beautiful little uh, golden colored sheet. Turn that golden colored sheet and you will find it says an introduction to God's covenants, an overview of the reformed doctrine of God's covenants. Now, this is part two of the introduction for the sake of him who uses the tape. This is part two of the introduction. Now, I cannot lecture on this in its detail. Observe, please, how many pages there are between this and the next little golden, uh, golden sheet. You see how many pages there are there? Uh, I count, uh, let's see, 50, 51 plus a few sheets after that. Now, I can't go through all this tonight. You remember I said that systematics is not an easy thing to do? Remember I said it's not the work of a man, it's not the work of an hour? Reading the Bible is not the work of a day. Studying an entire theme like covenants in which there are over 300 references in the Old Testament and about 30 more in the New Testament. Looking up and studying every one of those references in these old sheets of mine. Looking up and studying every one of these references. Oh, yeah. Look at that. You see that? You know who that is? Okay. This was when I was a student and everything was, everything was, you had to be cheap. And one time at Northeastern Bible College, a man by the name of Doug Oldham was supposed to come and do a, and do a concert, and he canceled his, canceled his concert for some reason. I'm sure old Doug had a good reason. And a friend of mine worked at the college, and these are all the posters from Doug Oldham's concert. So he gave me these old posters for the canceled concert, and, of course, I used them to do all my notes on the back of Doug Oldham posters. And for years when I would preach from Doug Oldham notes and I would flip my notes, people would see Doug Oldham looking at them, and people start laughing. I don't know why they were laughing. I finally figured it out. But anyway, yeah, these are the old days when I did these old notes. Well, here's a study of 300 passages on covenants. Now, look, you can't do that on your own like you're the only person to ever sit down and open up a Bible and, ex- and expect that you don't, you don't need the help of any illumination that's ever come from anybody else in the history of the church. That's, uh, that's not a right spirit. So what you have here in between these two, but I don't have the time to lecture on this. What you have here in between these two golden things is an effort to put into perspective for you a study of some of the major lights or recipients of illumination, not inspiration, they're not inspired, but of light illumination from the Lord having studied this topic this extensive topic, and I've tried to read through what they said and present it to you. Now, the problem is that, to be quite frank, my work here goes back uh, 22 years. This was basically written 22 years ago, to be honest with you. And I haven't updated it in 22 years. So it doesn't go anything beyond Christ of the covenants. Uh, Someone just handed me in between uh, the the lectures a an excellent systematic theology that's been written or published, I should say, in the last 22 years. And there are some other ones. Such insights as those are not included in here. So I don't claim that this is up to date with the latest, but it is, and I probably should, I won't deny, revise it for some of the thinking of people that have written in the last 20 years. But basically this study is some 22 years old. And I have, re- I have some, of course, edited it over the years and tried to clean it up, but this is basically the fruit of it. And this is what I went through. And this is why I selected it. Now, what I'm considering, and I, I want to just go over this with you in this second lecture. Just, uh, in a, it's really uh, in, in part two. It's not an entire lecture, really, because I can't read it all to you. I just want to let you read it. And I'm suggesting, please, those of you who are taking this course for credit, please read this because, you know, it's not that I'm going to give you, oh, yes, I am. Oh, yes, I am. I forgot. I am going to give you. There is a question on the test about this. There is a question on the test about part of this. And I'll tell you what it is later. But I would like you to read this. I would like you to read it because it's important. When I give these lectures on, on the, what the Bible teaches, and I go up through the different texts of the Bible, you need to understand that 
there's a there's a dogmatic. This is dogmatics. There's a background in dogmatics of what's been written by the, the the servants of God concerning this issue, and you need to be familiar with it because a lot of times we interact with that background, and so you should know. Now, this is what we're trying to do. Uh, I just want to read to you certain sections of this from page one. We consider only some of the major contributions to the development of the Doctrine of the Covenants in Reformed theology. God and his providence used the great religious revival known as the Reformation to give his church illumination regarding many vital aspects of salvation, including the promissory covenantal framework. I begin with the Westminster and London Confessions which stem from English Puritanism and epitomize the mature thinking of the Reformation. These confessions are of the greatest importance because they explicitly summarize the mature Reformed teaching on God's covenantal dealings with men, and they serve as the foundation. Reformed theologians who follow in the Puritan tradition build on and develop the teaching of those two confessions, the 1689 Baptist Confession and the Westminster, the Presbyterian Confession. The Puritan stream contains the writings and contributions of three very influential men, one a Baptist and two Presbyterians. First, the Baptist. We consider the contribution of Dr. John Gill. He represents Calvinistic Baptists. Then, the contributions of Charles Hodge and R.L. Dabney, whom I regard to be the fathers of Northern and Southern Presbyterianism, respectively. Charles Hodge, the, the teacher of systematics, and in that regard, the father of Northern Presbyterianism. And similarly, Dabney, the teacher of systematics, and in that regard, the father of Southern Presbyterianism. But the Reformed tradition has two major theological streams, not only the river flowing from England, but also the waters of Calvinism in Holland. And for that reason, we take up the contribution made by the Dutch Calvinists. Having surveyed what the uh, English Puritan and Dutch Calvinists say, then what I try to do is collate and summarize the classic Reformed teaching on God's covenants. And that's the part I expect you to know. The classic Reformed teaching on God's covenants. That is going to be on the test. I'm going to ask you to summarize that. And then we have the recent contribution to the doctrine of covenants which have been made, and I say recent, as of 1980, made by uh, Professor Mary, Meredith Klein, O. Palmer Robertson, those three men. Francis Territon also exercised a formative influence on Reformed thinking, but I don't treat him in detail because his thoughts are largely developed and established in the various movements. For example, Dabney used Territon as his textbook when he was teaching systematics. So I developed this under seven heads. The Westminster London Confessions, the teaching of John Gill, the teaching of Charles Hodge, the teaching of Dabney, the teaching of the Dutch Calvinists. And here I open up the Belgic and London Confessions and two of the major contributors to Dutch Calvinism who are Bavink and Burkhoff. Right? Bavink and Burkhoff. Now, unfortunately, I don't read Dutch. So I did not have access when I wrote this to a translation of Gereformier de Dogmatique, which is the uh, complete systematic theology of Hermann Bavink. I don't have that, and I can't read that. I wish I could, but I can't. And as far as I know, at the time, it wasn't translated into English. The only part that had been translated into English was the doctrine of God. The rest of it was not. But I do have access to a compendium which was translated, I think, by Henry Zylstra. And that, and that compendium is called Our Reasonable Faith. So I had, and that's written by Bobbing, and it's written in English, and in that he deals with the covenant of grace. And so I deal with that. Now, I know that's really not adequate, but that's the best I could do, and so that's why I present that. And this is what's important. Now, most of us have a background, there may be some to, of whom this is not true, but most of us have a background in English Puritanism 
whether we're Presbyterian or whether we're Reformed Baptist, our background for most of us is in English Puritanism and the Westminster and London Confessions. It's important for us to have what I would call theological cross-pollination between us and the Dutch Calvinists because they have the tremendous insights into this subject and in many subjects. And it's good for us to read, to be familiar with the Dutch Calvinists, with Bobbing, Burkhoff, the Canons of Dort, the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism. So important for us to be familiar with these documents because there's so much light given to those servants in the Dutch Calvinist stream. And my hope in approaching it this way is to foster communication, understanding, and uh, dialogue between the insights of Dutch Calvinism and the insights of English Puritanism with regard to the topics that are before us. Okay. Now the last part of this, notice at the end of page 51, the end of page 51, I want to explain this to you. There's a summary statement, and it's called God's Covenants and the Covenant of Grace. Now, these pages are the fruit of some work that was done some, let's see, how long ago is 1989? 13, 14 years ago? Some 13 or 14 years ago, when several of us were considering proposing to the Reformed Baptist churches a revision of the 1689 Confession of Faith. It was considered being proposed, and I was at Trinity in New Jersey at the time, by the church in Grand Rapids, the church in Mevin, the church at Trinity, the three churches. And this is part of the draft, this is just a draft of what was written at that time for consideration with regard to chapter 7. And I want to present it to you just so you can read it and know the type of work that was being done. Now later... We decided it wasn't a we decided it wasn't prudent thing to do. We felt uh, rather than revise the confession, best to stand on the confession and, if need be, draft additional things separately and independently, which would address uh, topics of concern in our own day and consider those in addition to the confession rather than revising the confession itself. So it was dropped. But in any event, this is the. This is the fruit of that work, and I want to pass that on to you also for you to read. Now, I really wish I had the time to go through it, but I don't. And especially because in this course, what we're trying to do is compress about 18 or 19 hours worth of study into some 14 or 15 hours. So there's just no way I can go through it. Okay. Does everybody understand what I've presented, why I've presented it, and why I've presented it the way I have? Any questions, concerns, issues, etc. about that? Yes, like Pastor comment. Smith. Of course. It's been my impression in reading through this material before that one of the things that I think is very beneficial about reading it is my, my own feelings about it as I read it was that there's a that you thoroughly cover from the standpoint of historical theology, what has been taught on the subject by Reformed theologians. Yes, but try to. But you also, when all is said and done, expose, when you're through, there are left exposed certain loose ends in the theology, Reformed theology on the subject of the covenants. Mm-hmm. That then what you're getting ready to get into actually takes those loose ends and ties them up. The attempt to do that, that's correct. And so it... That just to me would underscore the importance of reading this because you 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 look he he presents what this man taught and yet here were some things that don't add up really and there's some loose ends in what he taught and so when you're through surveying uh, what has been taught in the history of Reformed theology you're left with these questions that are still there and these loose ends that are still there and. Uh, then the rest, the rest of the lectures really, in my, for me anyhow, serve to then tie up the loose ends that have been left in the history of Reformed theology on the subject of covenants. No. Oh, that's what I'm trying to... Yes, thank you. So thank you, Pilar. So Appreciate just, that. Just to, as a, another encouragement of the importance of reading all this material. Thank you. All right. That's, he's pretty much accurately summarized what I've tried to do. I'd say that's, I'd say that's very accurate. 
Okay, if not, any further comments on that, then let's get started with the next. Now, this is where I want to spend the rest of the time this evening. And for the sake of him who tapeth, this is uh, now moving from... That completes Lecture 1 on your uh, lecture uh, sheet. And we move now to Lecture 2 on the lecture uh, schedule, the biblical revelation of God's covenants. Part 1 that I gave you was the theological introduction. I tried to put it in a theological perspective, the topic. And then part two is the historical introduction in which I attempted to give you to read the, uh, the, what the Reformed Dogmatics has said about this subject. Now, thirdly, the part three of the introduction, lecture two, the biblical revelation of God's covenants. We're going to consider what does the Bible say about the covenants of the promise. That's Paul talking there about the core of God's covenants his redemptive dealings and covenants with his people, from which the Gentiles were once strangers, but now have been brought into the commonwealth of Israel and into the fellowship of the people of God and into the economy of the covenants of God. And when they were strangers from those covenants, now they have been brought into them. Now, what does the scripture say about these things? Now, this is where I want to start. By way of introduction... I want to try to put, now, in terms of the materials here, the materials are found between the next two yellow sheets. And I'll get to those things eventually, but not right now. I want to start with something else that I haven't exactly handed out to you, but I do want to start with it. I want to put the whole subject of God's covenants into biblical perspective. And I I thought about when I first taught on this, how can I whet the appetites of those who study to approach this topic? And I, after some time, concluded that the best way to whet your appetite is to start with the truth that excited and warmed and blessed my own soul as I studied the covenants of God. And I hope that in the kind providence of God, the very same thing will warm your soul and will stir you up to consider these things enthusiastically. And coming to recognize the formative role of the covenants of God and the plan of redemption gave me a sense of theological security and peace. It made me more comfortable reading the Bible. It mapped out for me the forest of Scripture. It guided me so that wherever I was reading, I wasn't lost in the trees. The covenants of God enabled me to get my bearings in the Bible because they put perspective to it, the big picture. Now, consider with me the setting in which God enters into covenantal relations with men. God created man, and man rebelled against God and brought himself and all of his posterity under the wrath of God. And he left himself blind and dead and bound and lost in sin and cursed of God and slated for destruction. And man cannot rescue himself from sin and wrath and would not save himself if he could. If there's to be any salvation, if there's to be any deliverance, any hope for fallen man, it must be God who in mercy, undeserved kindness and compassion takes the initiative to deliver and save men. And the wonder and glory of the Bible, the very soul of its message, is that God actually does rescue and save men from sin. Immediately after the fall, God first comes to man and he introduces and announces, he declares, he proclaims his plan and his determination to save. He says to the devil, I will put enmity enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. He promises a deliverer to crush the devil's head, to rescue a remnant of mankind from sin. He doesn't fulfill this blessed promise of the Redeemer immediately. But rather first, over a span of some 4,000 years, 
he repeats, he enhances, he enlarges upon and further explains this promise of a deliverer. He progressively discloses more about his person and work and about how he saves men through the deliverer, Jesus Christ. And in this process, God actually intrudes into history with supernatural power to deliver, rescue, and save communities of men on three special occasions. Scripture records with marked emphasis these marvelous rescues which shaped the course of redemptive history. The first two supernatural remedial interventions by God into history are symbolic and they prepare the way for the third and final and greatest intervention by God which in the fullness of time God the Son comes and saves his people from their sins. You know what was the first time that God intruded into history in supernatural power to save or rescue a community or a group? First time God ever did anything like that in history? The what? That's right. That's right. He saved from the flood. The scripture tells us that this first great divine intervention to rescue came through the ark at the time of the flood. God intervened to save eight souls, Noah and his family and the animal pairs. God accomplished this rescue when he delivered them from the ark in the flood. The rest of the human race and all of the land animals perished under the floods of the wrath of God. The wrath of God in that flood brought the world that then was, as Peter calls it, to an end and ushered in the now world. 2 Peter 3, 6 and 7. Only eight human beings escaped And they escaped to the gracious initiative of the living God. Uh, Does scripture warrant this perspective? Does it ever say that men were saved from the flood? It does. Hebrews 11.7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving, rescuing, delivering of his house, by which... He condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Noah prepared an ark for the rescuing of his house. Noah's family was saved, rescued, delivered, not from hell, not from sin, but they were rescued from drowning in the flood. God took that initiative to rescue Noah's family and those pairs of animals in the ark. Consider 1 Peter 3.20, which says, Speaking of men which were sometime disobedient, when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, where the ark was a preparing, wherein in the ark few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. They were saved from the waters of the flood, which brought judgment upon the world that then was. When every living creature on the dry land, except those that were in the ark, perished, the world that then was was destroyed. And every human being that now is and every animal alive today descended from Noah and his sons and the animals that were in that ark. And it can be said of every human being and every animal on the face of the earth today that his ancestor was saved by God. Not saved from sin and wrath, but saved from the flood. Unless you realize that, you can't understand the world that now exists. That reality is the foundation of life in the present world. When they emerged from that ark, rescued by God, God spoke to Noah and his sons in words that are strikingly similar to the creation mandate that he gave to Adam at the beginning. He says, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, a remnant of the human race. And he gives that remnant a framework for life, a new creation order for a post-flood world, 
a remnant, a rescued remnant of humanity that emerged from that ark to which we all belong is a human race rescued by God from the flood, given ordinances for life, which God himself gave. I trust I don't have to say that that's a picture of the saving work of God in Jesus Christ. Is it not patent? What about the second great deliverance? God ever supernaturally intrude with supernatural power into history again to rescue any other group of people? You know, that's what encourages me. This stuff is clear, isn't it? It really is. It's Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Who else did he rescue? He rescued Hebrew. And this rescue was actually called the very... Okay, let's say he saved and he rescued them. Hebrew Israel. Right? The whole community. Does the Bible teach that? Absolutely. It says that he rescued or saved the Hebrew people from bondage in Egypt at the time of the Exodus. He took the initiative for the deliverance of men, moved with compassion. He manifested his omnipotence, broke the yoke of their oppressor, overpowered the forces that opposed them, and set them free. Does the scripture teach anywhere that God saved, delivered, rescued the Israelites? Absolutely. Exodus 3.8 says, God has come down to deliver, rescue, save them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land unto a good land. This divine rescue includes both emancipation from bondage, redemption from slavery, and bestowing or granting of the blessing, endowment with an inheritance, the promised land of Canaan. Or again, consider Exodus 14, verse 30, which says this, Thus Jehovah saved Israel that day. How? From sin? No. Out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And again, Jude 5 reads, The Lord, having saved a people, out of the land of Egypt, having rescued and delivered them from slavery in Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. So they were all saved, even those that didn't believe. It's not talking about salvation from sin. They weren't saved from sin. They didn't believe. And the ones that were saved that didn't believe perished. They weren't saved from sin. It's not talking about God saving from sin. It's talking about God saving from slavery and rescuing them from that slavery. And sometimes the word is used to describe that. And that's what it's talking about. And this is a supernatural act of God. Say, well, why would God go to the trouble to rescue people if he's not going to rescue them from sin? Well, look, God is teaching us things. God does what seems good and wise to him. He wants to teach us and he wants to teach us about rescue and he uses this way of teaching us. He gives us a picture of it. In rescuing these people from slavery, he's giving us a picture. That God's gone to an awful lot of trouble for a reason and it's a good reason because he's doing this that we might learn. Now third and finally, this is obviously another marvelous picture. Third and finally, Third and finally, you know what the third great intervention is? Within the framework of these two symbolic salvations, God fulfills his promise and saves his people from sin and wrath. And this is a supernatural act of God. In fact, God comes down, God himself, this is the most remarkable supernatural act of God of all of them. And the one, he gives a warning and causes them to build an ark, and the other one comes down with mighty plagues upon Egypt. But in this case, God himself, God the Son himself, actually comes down here to earth 
and becomes human without ceasing to be God. The Word became flesh. And that's a supernatural act. And the person who came to do it is God the Son, the supreme being himself. And he comes and saves, he rescues his people from their sins. This is the most marvelous, supernatural, divine intervention that ever was or ever could be conceived. And it's pictured in these two divine, supernatural rescues of a community from a flood and from slavery in Egypt. When it says he shall save his people, that's talking about the accomplishment of redemption through the person and work of Christ, his incarnation, perfect life, atoning death on the cross. To sum up, in each of these great deliverances, God intrudes supernaturally into history and rescues from a flood, from bondage in Egypt, and from sin. And all of this to expound, all of this to fulfill, this promise, this commitment, this emancipation proclamation, which he made in the Garden of Eden. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and your seed and her seed, and he will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. Welcome. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Now, therefore, why did God twice intervene in history with rescues that are both symbolic and preparatory before accomplishing this promised rescue? And here's the answer. God discloses the one way of salvation progressively and he has closely connected that progressive revelation of salvation with these three major interventions. Through the two symbolic ones, he provides a very colorful picture of redemption from sin before he accomplishes it through Jesus Christ. He doesn't reveal this way he saves from sin all at once. He reveals it progressively and through its full disclosure comes in Christ. That's what we read in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, that God, at a time, little piecemeal, spoke. But now, in the end of the days, he's spoken to us finally and completely through his Son. Now, the question that you may have for me is, I thought you said you are going to present to me the biblical revelation of God's covenant. So, the question you may have for me is, what does all of this have to do with God's covenants? Right? What does it have to do with it? Well, here's the answer, folks. The answer is that, in fact, when God did these rescues, every single time, God made a covenant with the entire community that he rescued. He made a covenant with all of those that were in the ark. He made a covenant with the entire Hebrew nation. He made a covenant with the entire community that he saved from sin. The record of this covenant with the entire, all the ark dwellers, the record of that covenant is found in Genesis chapter 9, verses 12 to 17. The record of this covenant, which he made with the Hebrew nation, is found in really Exodus through Deuteronomy. It's found, say, Exodus 19, 4 and 5, and Deuteronomy 29, 12, 13 is the beginning from the beginning to the end. It's the record of this covenant which he made with the Hebrew Israel. This covenant, and this covenant is called the Old Covenant in the Bible. This covenant here that he makes is a covenant that he makes with Christian Israel.
And this is called the new covenant. And this covenant begins to be revealed in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And the, the covenant is spoken of and told about in the New Testament in Luke 22:20. 20. It's spoken of in Hebrews 8, 6 to 13. Okay. Do we need to take a break? I think we do. Let's just take a little brief break here from the camera. Now, were you folks able to pay attention to what I was saying? I don't know what's going on, but were you guys able to pay attention to what I was saying at all, or were you just so distracted that you didn't hear any of it? Did you get it all? You did? Okay. Well, while those guys, whatever that situation is, whether they deal with it, I trust graciously. And in fact, before we put the camera back on, let's pray that that would be to that end. Let's pray. I don't know what's going on, but I know God does. And let's pray for the Lord's blessing on it. Father, we, we commit this situation to you. We know that you know what's happening. We pray for whatever it is, whatever the needs are, whatever the situation is, that you would deal with it in mercy. You would deal with it in kindness and love and grace. Give wisdom to your servants and that it might be a means of blessing, a means of kindness a means of the display of the very gospel love and grace and kindness we're talking about. Pray we might see it. We might see it expressed in power in this very night for the glory of Jesus Christ. We pray you would work your marvelous power to comfort, to encourage, to rescue, to save. Whatever you know the need is, we pray you would abundantly meet it, minister to it through your grace that's in Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen. Okay. Now, what are we going to do with the tape? Is the fellow that's running the tape still here? All right. Can we can we move on? Can we turn it back on? Well, you mean it was all this was all on tape? Yeah. The prayer and everything. <laughs> okay. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. That's all right. I, I, it doesn't matter. The Lord knows. Yeah. The Lord knows. Okay. Now, where were we? I was here. You follow these, you follow these passages? See all that? God makes a covenant with the people that experience these deliverances. He makes, he makes a covenant with every one of these communities. And these last two deliverances have special significance because at this point, he delivers this is what I would call the people of God. The people of God. First, he saves his people from Egypt, and then he saves his people from sin. When he saves his people from Egypt, he enters into covenant with that entire community that he saved from Egypt. When he saves his people from sin, he enters into covenant with the entire community that he saved from sin. With the first that he saved from Egypt, who are his people, he enters the old covenant. With the second that he saves from sin, he enters the new covenant. And these are called divine redemptions. And these are used to organize the revelation of his inspired word concerning salvation through Jesus Christ. And through these two great redemptions, God formed his people into two communities of his redeemed heirs. First, Hebrew Israel, the Hebrew nation, and second, Christian Israel, the Christian church. And to those redeemed societies in covenant with himself, God entrusted the Bible, the inspired, complete, sufficient, revelation about how he saves from sin. And he bases the very structure of Scripture on this close connection between revelation and redemption. The Bible has two bodies of revelation, each associated with these redeemed communities of his people. Now, please note well that the distinguishing trait of the Hebrew people 
was that they were redeemed from Egypt and given Canaan as inheritance. Their distinguishing trait as a community was not saving faith. We already saw that in the very passage that talked about their salvation. That they were saved not from sin, but from Egypt. Most of them didn't believe. And God entered that old covenant and gave that complete body of revelation, the Old Testament, to a community that had as its distinguishing trait experiencing redemption from Egypt and receiving Canaan as inheritance from God. He gave the New Testament in Greek in connection with the formation of the Christian church under a new covenant. And the distinguishing trait of those to whom the new body of revelation is given is that they've been redeemed from their sins and the blood of the Lamb and have received the Holy Spirit as the down payment of their inheritance. And with this new redeemed community, God enters into a new covenant and gives a new body of revelation, the New Testament. The current arrangement of the Bible displays this covenantal structure. The Old Testament is divided into three basic sections. The formation and history of Hebrew Israel. The religious, that's Genesis to Esther. The experience, the religious experience of Hebrew Israel, Job to the Song of Solomon. And the hope or eschatological perspective of Hebrew Israel, Isaiah to Malachi. Now I know there's overlap between these things. And you'll you'll find some history in the prophets and some experience in in the Pentateuch and, and the rest. That's true. But these are the basic themes that, by which it's divided into the three basic parts today. I know scripture was reorganized, but that's the way it's come to us. And you can see that it's associated with that nation and given to them in their language, Hebrew. It's the language of his people under the Old Covenant. Then you could see also the same basic pattern in the New Testament. You have the formation of Christian Israel, the story of that formation through Christ and the apostles in Matthew to Acts. Secondly, the apostolic rule or oversight or direction of Christian Israel, the uh, the epistles from Romans to Jude, and finally the hope or eschatological perspective of Christian Israel, which is the book of Revelation. And again, there's overlap, but there is, and, and they're not ironclad, but you see the basic New Testament arranged in accordance with the community in covenant with God that received that body of revelation. And you see the connection between the revelation that God gives and the redemption that God works. He works redemption from Egypt and gives the community redeemed from Egypt revelation, the Old Testament. He works redemption from sin and gives the community redeemed from sin revelation, the New Testament. But note well, there's two testaments, but there's only one Bible. Because there's two redemptions from Egypt and sin and two covenants, old and new, but only one people of God and only one gospel, and only one way of salvation from sin. And this is the reason why the New Testament does not completely cancel out the Old Testament. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the Old Testament, but to fulfill it. But rather it supplements it, and it defines the many different ways in which the Old Testament relates to the people of God under the New Covenant. Obviously, the New Testament scriptures were not canon for Hebrew Israel, because they never saw the New Testament scriptures. But the whole Bible is given to us, not just the New Testament, because the whole Bible is revelation given to us and relevant to us and canon for us. And indeed, the New Testament scriptures sanction no other attitude toward the Old Testament scriptures in 1 Corinthians 10, 6 to 11, and Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 17. And this is true precisely because the most intimate organic connection exists between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. This is the covenant I'll make after those days. I'll write my law on their hearts. The very law that he engraved on tables of stone, he now writes on the hearts of his people. He says that he makes a new covenant with the house of Israel. There's a close connection between Christian Israel and Hebrew Israel. Through the ministry of John the Baptist and God incarnate, Jesus Christ, God comes and prunes Hebrew Israel. And it shall come to pass, Moses said, that the Lord will raise up a prophet like unto me and whoever will not listen to the words of that prophet will be cut off from among the people. And when they didn't listen, they were cut off from among the people. And he so pruned Hebrew Israel that all that was left 
was the disciples of God incarnate, Jesus Christ. And with that remnant of Hebrew Israel, Christian Israel, they were all Hebrew Israel and they were all Christian Israel. They were disciples of Jesus and they were Hebrews. With that remnant, he made the new covenant. He made it the night of his departure when he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it, remembrance of me. So he made a new covenant with them. And then, and this is the most amazing part, the most incredible part of all, is that when he made this new covenant, and this is where the controversy happened, for a while, as Christian Israel grew through the preaching of the gospel, people getting converted in the day of Pentecost and afterwards, and Christian Israel, which is the Christian church, now receives the Holy Spirit. So it has the new covenant instituted and they're taking the Lord's Supper. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and they receive the down payment of their inheritance. Now they've experienced redemption, inheritance, new covenant. And they're all Jewish, Acts 1 through 9. The Samaritans are included. They're all somehow associated with Hebrew Israel. Now something radical, something wild happens, something unthinkable, something they could never conceive of. God grafts Gentiles who have no genetic, well, I shouldn't say no genetic, no blood relation connection to Abraham as his physical seed, he grafts them who are uncircumcised in body, he takes them and he grafts them into Christian Israel. What a controversy it stirred up. Acts 15 tells the story. And when the dust of that controversy settles, you now have Christian Israel which is composed of disciples of Jesus Christ, both Hebrews and Gentiles, in one body, Christian Israel. And that's why it said, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. And Jesus says, this is the new covenant. And he institutes it. And this is why the church in Corinth just Gentiles, is part of the commonwealth of Israel and takes the cup indicating that they are included in the new covenant community. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. They're included. And this is what Paul's talking about when he's talking about the covenants of the promise. You were strangers from the covenants of the promise. You were strangers, but now no longer. Now you're part of the commonwealth of Israel under the new covenant. And God took that barrier between the Gentile and the Jew and he broke it down through the cross of Jesus Christ and he brought together in one community the commonwealth of the new covenant, the commonwealth of Christian Israel. He brought together Gentiles and Jews who are believers and disciples. With them he makes the new covenant. So there's an organic, intimate connection between Hebrew Israel and Christian Israel. Israel on the Old Covenant and Israel on the New Covenant. There's not two peoples of God. There's one people of God, Israel. And God transformed His people. He cut the unbelievers out. Every soul that does not listen will be cut off. Cut off from Israel. Cut out. Cut them out. Paul said they were broken off. They were cut out of the covenant community because they reject Messiah. And then he grafted in Gentiles into that very same community, Israel. They became part of it. What a controversy. Did you see why it stirred up that controversy? We can't have Gentiles in this community. They're uncircumcised. They don't have the right bloodline connections. We can't have them in here. There was a problem. But no, they didn't understand that God was reforming and reviving his people. So there's not two different peoples of God. There's one people of God, but Jesus, the great reformer prophet, took them through that reformation and cut the unbelievers out and grafted the Gentile believers into that one and the same community. And the proof of it was when God gave those Gentiles the inheritance and poured out the Holy Spirit on Cornelius. And Peter says, what are we going to say to that? Can we refuse water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just like we did? They receive the same spirit. They're included in the inheritance. They're part of us. 
God made him part of us. And that's the marvel of it. Now, you see, with these two communities, you have the two bodies of revelation and one Bible because you have one people of God. You have one way of salvation from sin, even that which was promised way up here in Genesis 3 and verse 15. Now, all this being said, say, well, what about what you said before? What about what you said before about those other covenants? Remember you talked about Abraham, about David, about Jesus? What about that? Well, there's a connection. Oh, let me tell you, there's a connection. I use circles for the communities. Now we use boxes for the men. The first mention of the word covenant in the Bible, the first mention of it is in Genesis 6.18. And he says to a certain man, his righteous servant, this is his righteous servant, Noah. Are we getting close to 80 minutes? Getting close? Do I need to stop soon? How much time? Okay, I'm almost done. Says to his righteous servant Noah, says to his righteous servant Noah, I establish my covenant with thee, you singular Noah. Enter into the ark. And the first starts with Noah. And then through Noah, Noah's descendants, the ark dwellers, all of his, his eight, his eight, the eight family members, including Noah, his three children, his three sons and their wives, and all the animals. They're all closely connected with Noah. There's a connection, there's a conjunction, a union between God's righteous servant Noah in covenant with God and the community that he saves and rescues from the flood in the ark. Noah is the instrument and the means of rescuing the saved community. So you have God's righteous servant Noah and then you have the saved community rescued through his righteous servant who is connected with God's righteous servant by being his posterity, his children, his seed. See that? And this forms a pair or a complex or an economy. Call it the Noahic economy of the covenants of God. The Noahic economy. This, these ark dwellers are never said to be the people of God, but they are a remnant of humanity rescued by God. And it includes all the ark dwellers and all the animals. And as I'll show you, this is established with those who were rescued from the flood firsthand and with successive generations of ark dwellers, I don't know how to show that except to draw a line that comes down like this, and then I'm going to start writing all over my own self. And I'm going to, and this is what I used to do in the academy, make big messes and everybody laughed. Because I would, would write lines like this over there and lines like that over there. And before you had done lines all over the place. So I'm not going to do it. Imaginary lines. I mean, now you laugh anyway. Imaginary lines. The successive generations. Can you see successive generations of ark dwellers here from the flood to the fire? From the flood to the fire, successive generations of ark dwellers. The ark dwellers and their posterity. And within that community of ark dwellers, God, in, and this is totally sovereign. I mean, just God picked this one man. One man out of that community. Descended from Noah. One man comes out of that community. One man. One man who was an idolater through a son named Shem. And the Bible takes you right through that whole history. And who is that man? What's his name? Abraham. And he says to Abraham, he's going to make Abraham the father of his people. Now, within the community of ark dwellers, God focuses on a remnant. The people of God. And you see the significance of that remnant. So God comes to Abraham. He comes to Abraham, Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. He says, I'll make a covenant with you. He tells him more about that covenant in Genesis 17, 1 to 14. He ultimately 
prepares him and says that covenant to him in Genesis 22, 16 to 18, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Then God confirms these same promises, the promise about land and the promise about Christ, the promise that your seed will inherit the land and the promise in your seed will all the families of the earth be blessed. Land, Christ. Canaan, Christ. He confirms those promises to Isaac, as we'll see, Genesis 26. He confirms those same promises to Jacob, Genesis 28. Genesis 26, Isaac. Genesis 28, Jacob. So you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs. And look at this. Look at this. What is this? There's a connection. It's no accident that this particular nation or community got rescued. Why? Because they are the descendants, the posterity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who's Jacob? What did God change his name to what? Israel. He made the covenant promise of the patriarchs to Abraham that I will give your descendants the land of Canaan as their inheritance and I will be their God and they will be my people. They will be the people of God. And he said the same to Isaac and he said the same to Jacob. And then the scripture teaches very clearly in uh, Exodus chapter 6 that God is fulfilling these promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when he redeems Hebrew Israel in the wilderness generation. And this is the wilderness generation. The wilderness generation of Israel. And he sets up this covenant not only with the wilderness generation. He starts to make the covenant with them. At the beginning, when they just entered the wilderness, after they miraculously crossed the Red Sea at Mount Sinai. And then he completes that covenant with them just before they leave the wilderness, before they miraculously cross the River Jordan and go into their inheritance in Canaan. So, and you find the record of that in Exodus to Deuteronomy. And it's very clear in Exodus chapter 6 that everything he's doing with Hebrew Israel in redeeming them and giving their inheritance, he says, I will redeem them and I will take them to myself for a people and I will give them their inheritance. And that's exactly what he does. Redeems them from Egypt. You read the story. Exodus 7 to 14. He takes them to himself for a people. He makes covenant with them. You read the story. Exodus to Deuteronomy. Then he gives them their inheritance and brings them into the promised land just like he promised. So he makes the old covenant with Abraham's posterity, Abraham's physical descendants, circumcised in body, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in fulfillment of this promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that their descendants, physical posterity, would be the people of God. And God takes them to himself for a people. He enters covenant with them in the wilderness generation. And then he establishes this. What was the law? The law was given. He establishes this covenant with them from generation to generation. The law was added until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Successive generations of Hebrew Israel starting from the wilderness, going through successive generations and the final generation when the seed comes to whom the promise had been made. See, because God made two promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. First, he fulfills when he redeems his people from Egypt. And the second he fulfills, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed when he redeems his people from sin. So he takes those promises. I'm going to give your posterity the land. And he fulfills it. And then he says, I'm going to send Christ and he's going to come as your descendant and bless all the families of the earth, and then he fulfills it. He fulfills the first in the Hebrew economy of the people of God. He fulfills the second in the Christian economy of the people of God. So this Hebrew Israel, as the old covenant community comes to an end, as Christ comes and transforms it, now there's something else. Within this Hebrew community, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Hebrew Israel, a man emerges from this Hebrew community. A man emerges. A righteous servant of God. That God again just comes down and picks him. And what's his name? His name? David. The son of Abraham, the son of David. Within the scope of Hebrew Israel and the the old covenant society and community, 
God comes down and he picks a man, David, and he says, David, he's the king. And he makes David the king and he rises him up to the throne. And then he tells him when he's on the throne, I am going to perpetuate your kingdom forever. And you read these promises to David in Psalm 89, 3 and 4 and following. Psalm 89. See how, look at, look at this. Genesis 6, Genesis 9, Genesis 15, Exodus, Psalm. A whole of redemptive history is here. He says, as a promise to David, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of the covenants made with Abraham and David. He says he's going to raise up his son to sit upon his throne. Psalm 89 goes on to tell a story. It tells a story about the fact that, you know, there was a succession of kings that reigned in Judah on the throne of David until the time of the Babylonian captivity. And God fulfilled that through the Davidic dynasty. But then what happened? Psalm 89 laments the problem. Psalm 89 says that you have profaned the covenant of your servant. You've cast his crown to the ground. They went into captivity. There was no king for several hundred years. He says, what's going on? Why is this happening? Why is there no king? Remember your former mercies. Establish your covenant. And there's a hope that God will restore the throne of David and put a king on that throne. And they'll have a king to rule over them again. And they're waiting for that covenant promise to be fulfilled. So what are they waiting for? They're waiting for someone to come, the seed of Abraham, in whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. What are they waiting for? The seed of David, in fulfillment of the promise to reign on the throne of David. And in the fullness of time, God sends his son, his righteous servant, Jesus. And he cuts off the wicked from the old covenant brings the old covenant community to its final generation until the seed should come to whom the promise has been made, the seed of David, the seed of Abraham. And God enters into covenant with Jesus. Jesus. Psalm 110, verse 4. And Hebrews 7, 20 to 28. God enters into covenant with Jesus, with the Messiah, with the God-man, in his resurrection from the dead. The psalm foretells it. The inspired psalm says, Thou art priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And listen to this language. The Lord has sworn. He swore an oath to him. Now, as I'll show you, that promise connected with an oath is what covenant means. I'll show you that, God willing, in a few minutes in that last hour. And that's what, he, that's what he says to him. He swears an oath to him. And he swears an oath to the resurrected Christ. The word of the oath, says the writer to Hebrews. The word of the oath. The word of the covenant with Christ. The word of the oath. Appoints a son. Perfected forevermore. The resurrected Christ. Impeccable in glory. Is promised perpetual. Royal. High priesthood. Thou art priest forever. And then there's a contrast between his high priesthood and the Aaronic priests and the superiority of his priesthood because by death they can't continue and God never made them priests forever with an oath. But he with an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. So he entered covenant. Can you see Christ going up into heaven, seating at the right hand of God as the psalm sees it. Sit at my right hand until I make that enemies the footstool of my feet, at thy feet. And the Father says to him, thou art priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord has sworn. Enters the covenant with him. Then that Jesus, we read of him, he shall see his seed. Isaiah 53. Is there no connection between Jesus and Christian Israel? Of course there is. Because these are Jesus' seed. They are his disciples. They are his children who are born to him through the gospel. And he, first of all, called them out from Hebrew Israel and then he grafted into them his children from every kindred, tribe, and tongue. And he established the new covenant with the apostolic generation of Christian, uh, of Christian Israel with the church And he set it up successively, as we read in Ephesians 3.21, in every generation, until Christ comes again. 
in the fire. It's set up successively from generation to generation with successive generations of Jesus' seed, Jesus' posterity, Jesus' children, Jesus' people that he saves from sin. And God enters this new covenant with them. This is the new covenant in my blood. He's the mediator of a better covenant. He mediates it. He mediates it through the gospel method. A prophet mediator like Moses in his prophetic work A prophet will the Lord God raise up like unto me. And every soul that does not hearken to the voice of that prophet will be cut off from among the people. And how does Jesus mediate it? He mediates it by the same gospel method that John, the last prophet John, shows us the mediating gospel method. What is it? Preach repentance. Preach the kingdom. Make disciples. Baptize them. That's what Jesus does. Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. He preaches the gospel. He preaches the kingdom. He makes disciples. He baptizes them. That's how Jesus mediates the covenant between God and his people. He mediates it through his prophetic work. He mediates it through his kingly work. He mediates it through his priestly work. Thus, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Now, that's the picture. You have the Christian economy of the people of God. You have the Hebrew economy of the people of God. You have a, in the Christian economy, the people of God, you have a covenant with his righteous servant, Jesus, and then a covenant with his people saved and rescued from sin, Jesus' children, mediated by Jesus. In the Hebrew economy of the people of God, you have a covenant with his righteous servant, Abraham, and then a covenant with the people redeemed from Egypt, who are the posterity of his righteous servant Abraham and ruled over by his righteous servant David. In, the, in this Noahic economy, you have a community, a, a community covenant made with those who are saved and rescued from the flood and who are connected to the righteous servant of God, Noah, in covenant with God. So you have the righteous servant, the saved community, the righteous servants and the saved community, the righteous servant, the saved community. Thus the righteous servants, Noah, and Abraham and David and their relation to the communities, they're all pictures of the work of Christ and what Christ has done. And all of this in fulfillment of this promise of God, of Genesis 3.15, that he will rest.